Um, hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to another episode of the All the Investor Podcast that aims you to equip you with the right knowledge to make your decisions with respect to investments. My name is Yashwanta, and I'll be your host today. And today, I'm delighted to welcome Samir Bhandari, who's the co founder and CFO of Edgebits, a fractional real estate platform. Samir has worked in various institutions like Bank of America, UBS, JP Morgan, and in his last role, he was the MD and co chair of sales globally at Nomura, based out of Singapore. I'm really excited about this, this podcast as Samir has a wealth of knowledge in the financial domain. And, you know, if I was in my corporate career, I would tell uh, someone to get a coffee, get a personal me. Uh, so I'm personally looking forward to learn from him a lot in this podcast. And it's my absolute pleasure to have you, Samir, on the show. A very warm welcome and thank you for being this for a being day. Thank you, yes, so much for having me. Thank you. How are you doing today, Samir? I, I realize you're based out of Sydney, so it's late, uh, but uh, I'll pay shape the game that time. No, thank you. I'm actually based out of Singapore, uh, just That's traveling right. to traveling to ah. uh, Sydney for the week. Right. So, Sami, let's get into it. Uh, 34 years in banking and then HBITS, uh, two years running. Why did you make that switch? So, firstly, let me uh, just talk a bit about why I took banking. Yeah. Uh, you know, well, um, I did my chartered accountancy and then uh, passed out from my MBA. I am Ahmedabad in 1989. I mm-hmm. always wanted to be in banking. I mean, that was my career choice. Mm-hmm. Um, and, Is that and, because of the and, money? Well, to be honest, one was definitely that. Uh, right. I wouldn't. I wouldn't deny that. Uh, but banking, I, I just thought that I could use my child accountancy knowledge, I, my MBA in finance and marketing. Actually, I could learn. So okay. that was very, very important to me. And and mm-hmm. I said, you know, I want to get into a career. Mm. Which I don't only like, but I love. Mm. Because then, then you know, when you talk about work life balance, if you love your work, then mm. that becomes your life. Mm. And that was very, very important to me. Mm. Uh, so I took up banking from the beginning, worked there for 34 years, loved every day. You know, mm. I worked in four very beautiful, fantastic institutions. Uh, mm. Amongst, uh, so Bank of America, I worked in Mumbai and Hong Kong. I worked in UBS um, mm. in Singapore. I worked in JP Morgan for nine years in Singapore. And last but not least, uh, Nomura uh, for 13 years in Singapore. Love nice. every day. Every day I would get up and want to go to work. Mm. And that, that kept me that kept me going. Mm. When I lost that spark mm. uh, in December 21, I decided time has come to move on. Mm. Uh, and that's when I retired from banking after, after 34 years. Mm. Then the question for me was, what next? What mm. should I do? And there were two or three choices. One is, fortunately, banking pays you a reasonable amount mm. of money. So I, yep. could have, I could have decided I don't want to do anything. That was always one, one option. But then, you know, when, when people are looking at uh, longevity today, people are living till 1995, you at least want to work till 75 or 80. Mm. And, and that was one of, the, one of the reasons why I said, okay, let me, let me do something which is very interesting. Hmm. Now, property for me as an asset class uh, has been roughly 50 to 60% for my overall portfolio. Hmm. And fortunately for me, Yash, I've done really well. So I have homes in Singapore, New York, homes in Singapore, New York, uh, and India. And mo- most of the time, the timing has been very good. So that's, that's actually worked out really, really well for me. Uh, I wanted to do something around the technology world because obviously when I retired from banking, I was not a tech person. So I needed mm. to learn a bit around that. So I said, can I combine property and technology and do something around the prop tech world? Mm. And I was looking at different options. And when Shiv came along, so Shiv pitched his business to me. Right. Um, I, li- I liked the concept. And I said, okay, you know what? This is something which really interests me where... I think I would love it if mm. I if I get into it. Because mm. as I mentioned earlier, Yash, it's all about loving what you do, right? I mm. don't want you to do something I like. I mm. want to do something which I love. Because mm. then I can give as much time as I as I want. And there's no question of work-life balance because you're loving your work there. Mm. Um, so that's when I decided to get into uh, HBITS. Okay. Initially joined as CFO 
And then within a year, Shiv and I got along so well. Then hmm. Shiv said, why don't you become also co-founder and accelerate, right. accelerate growth for us? Hmm. So that's really the thought process I had. And hmm. I'm loving every day. It's been hmm. almost two years. I'm going to finish in June. Hmm. I'm loving every every day working with HRs. Great. Great, Sami. Uh, can I ask, how did you and Shiv meet? Like, how did you get introduced? Uh, so, very interesting. Firstly, uh, uh, he was introduced through a common friend. Right, okay. Uh, and and uh, he was actually quitting uh, his business to me. Right. Uh, initially, initially, more as an investor. Right, okay. And I, I, I actually liked the concept, and that's why I was, right. even, if I, even if I had not joined him, I would mm. have definitely invested invested in his business. Mm. Uh, I still remember the day. I still remember the day I was in the U.S. when we had this conversation, and you know everything clicked well. I went to India to meet him. Mm. Uh, that was a great conversation we had. Uh, we had very common goals, mm. what we wanted to achieve, and it really worked well. And so far, mm. it's been it's been fantastic. No, amazing, amazing. Uh, I mean, a success for a startup is primarily also down to the cohesiveness of founders and the understanding, which is understanding, right? So that's amazing. Um, you mentioned that you have 65 to 70 percent of your portfolio in property, which is kind of astonishing to me because a lot of, I would say, influencers or people advise you not to invest in property or, you know, your residential homes or whatever. How, what particular things did you look at to let's say get out of that goal and do exceptionally well, like you have said? So I think, yes, a few things are very important, right? Uh, mm. One is the timing of that decision. Mm. So I was very fortunate. And let me talk about timing, say, in Singapore. Mm. Uh, Singapore, I bought my first property around 2005. Okay. And that was the time when the casinos were just about coming up. Okay. And I took the view that Singapore is actually going to change. The skyline is going to change. Mm. And this is the time to get into it. Mm. And, and fortunately for me, since I've come, got in, I mean, the property prices are up almost four times. Mm. So that's helped. In India, uh, as you know, the pre-Modi government, uh, real estate did actually extremely, extremely well. Okay. And if you had a uh, uh, good timing, if the location of the property was very good, mm. you actually did extremely well. Mm. Plus, plus, I think luck plays a very important part. Yash, without mm. luck, I mean, you can, you can keep trying. You mm. can keep trying, but nothing really works. Mm. So I think a combination of these, these three. So I've been, I've been, in a way, very lucky also. Mm. And fortunately, a lot of my wealth has been created with property. It's amazing. Amazing. Some lessons for my father to learn there. <laughs> the family. Um, okay. Uh, can you explain what is HVITS and what are you trying to achieve by HVITS? So let me talk about first what is HVITS. Right. Uh, we are a platform which democratizes real estate. Okay. Or fractionalizes real estate. Okay. So we give an option to the normal person or a retail investor mm. to own a fraction of commercial real estate. Mm. And why commercial real estate? For two reasons. One is it gives passive income of 8 to 9%. Mm. Uh, and secondly, it gives capital appreciation of typically between 6 to 7%. Mm. And you can be very certain about that because commercial properties sell on cap rates or rental yields. So yeah. unlike residential, which the the rental yields are very very low, or unlike holiday homes, uh, which which basically sell on sentiment, commercial yeah. property sells on cap rates, rental yields, and that's okay. what we try and bring to an investor. An investor as an alternative investment, which gives you returns of fifteen to sixteen yeah. percent. Plus, on the other side, on the supply side, we are also helping developers exit some of the properties. And that was one of the genesis of why HVIX was really formed. We yes. wanted to help our retail investors participate in, in this asset class, which is extremely lucrative. Mm. And we also wanted to help our developers in India to exit some of their properties. Mm. Because either they could exit the whole building to Blackstone or Brookfield, 
uh, which obviously buys thousand fifteen hundred yeah, yeah. crores, or they could go to a high net worth individual for twenty twenty five crore asset. Mm. Here we've created an asset class from anything between twenty five and five hundred crores, mm. which we give access to the developers and to the retail investors. Mm. Uh, also, also yes, I feel uh, this asset class. If you compare to any other asset class, let's compare it to fixed income. Yeah. Fixed income gives you returns of 7 to 8%. Correct. Equities over large periods of time, or so long periods of time, I would say, especially large caps, give you anything between 13 and 15%. Correct. Commodities that you see as an asset class gives you anything between 7 and 8%. Again, long periods of time I'm talking mm, about. Correct. Commercial property, actually, if you can hold it for four, five, six years, can actually give you returns of 15 to 16%, which are in fact a lot better than a lot of these other asset classes. Hmm. Interesting. Uh, within four to five years, you say? Yeah. The holding period should be, we advise at least four to five years. Hmm. Uh, and beyond that, definitely IRRs, you can expect of hmm. 15 to 16%. Hmm. Interesting. Uh, do you feel the fractional ownership place now, uh, the play in India is kind of heating up right now with so many new players entering into the picture? And do you, I mean, do you feel the heat of the competition at Uh Yes, I feel uh, this business, the barriers to entry are extremely high. Really? And well, I'll yeah. give you the, yes. And people don't understand this, but, but there are reasons for it. Okay. Firstly, let's look at the supply side. When you're when you're identifying properties, when you're uh, deciding which micro market you should be investing in, uh, whether it's the right building you're buying into, mm. I think that requires a lot of domain knowledge. Mm. So people feel that they have the domain knowledge, but mm. I can assure you, being now uh, so involved for the last two years, it's not easy. Mm. So so that is uh, one. Secondly, acquiring investors mm. uh, and having investors to trust your platform takes yes. time. Yeah. Mm. I mean, Shiv Shiv started this company in 2019. I mm. joined him two years back to accelerate growth, but he has been at it for almost four to five years, Correct. and that's how we've actually built the brand. Yeah. That's how we've built people uh, wanting to trust us. Mm. So I'm actually, honestly, Yash, I think there'll be two or three players left mm. in this uh, industry. Uh, and a lot of the others will start doing probably uh, some, some other things. So I actually don't see uh, competition as such. I think we compete against ourselves. Mm. Like we are at 365 crores of AUM. We want to be at 1,500 crores of AUM this year. Mm. So we are competing against uh, ourselves to acquire more properties, to increase the velocity of sales, making mm. sure we get new investors in, making sure we educate the investors in. Mm. And with with uh, SEBI now regulating us, mm. obviously a lot of wealth firms also want to distribute our product. Yeah. So I think I think we, we are going to compete against ourselves. And the market is so large, it's not winner takes all, right? Mm. There'll, be, there'll, be, there'll be space for two, three, even more players if necessary. Mm. But I do do feel very strongly that barriers to entry for this are extremely, extremely high. It's not like selling a mutual fund. You know, it's mm. very, very different. Selling a mutual fund, anyone can do it. Mm. Selling cash equities, anyone can do it. But selling property, it's not everyone's cup of tea. Got it. Uh, you mentioned SEBI regulating you. Can you talk about that regulation? Yes. Yeah, so uh, uh, SEBI on March 8th, uh, formally said that they would be regulating us. They call yeah. it the MSM, MSM REIT. Yeah. Uh, uh, this actually is a very, very welcome sign for us. Yeah. You know, now the product is kosher. Yeah. You know, it's got the stamp of approval from, from SEBI. Yeah. Uh, all the units are going to be listed on the, on the exchange. Yeah. Uh, the, the sponsor would have to have a 5% skin in the game. Yeah. And 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 twenty crores uh, minimum minimum capital which would be required. Mm. Uh, the minimum ticket size would come down from twenty five lakh to ten lakhs. Yeah. But the beauty is because it's going to be traded on the exchange, mm. the liquidity definitely will improve. Mm. Right now, you know, if someone wants to exit, we don't have any issues around exit. 
They can exit mm. any time, but it takes around 30 to 45 days to exit. But mm. once you are listed on an exchange, obviously liquidity becomes, becomes a, a lot, lot, lot yeah. better. And right. you'll be regulated by SEBI, uh, which again is very, very wealthy. Mm. Interesting. Uh, but before I come into questions related to this regulation, because I'm very curious and uh, talking to other players, I've figured that there might be some gaps which people are still seeking clarification on. Can you also explain to the viewers what is a REIT uh, per se? So REIT is, uh, if you if you expand, it's basically a real estate investment trust. Right. Uh, it's a trust which buys properties. Right. And in the traditional REIT, uh, globally, if you see, right. uh, they buy commercial buildings. No. Uh, they typically would leverage the REIT. Uh, most of the players leverage 40 to 50 percent. Uh, and and uh, and they then any income which they get from the commercial buildings through rental, yeah. uh, 90 to 95 percent is distributed to the investors. Yeah. REITs are typically listed on the exchange. Yeah. Uh, two things which impact REITs, REITs trade like equities. Okay. So when and this is globally I'm talking about. Mm. When equity prices go down, mm. REIT prices typically will go down. Mm. Also, REIT prices get affected by interest rates. Right. So as we've seen interest rates going up, mm -hmm. uh, REIT prices obviously have got affected. Mm. And let me talk a bit around the U.S. Uh, since we are talking about REIT. Mm. Uh, U.S. Uh, REITs have got decimated. Uh, there are REITs which are down 50%. Wow. And there are REITs which are, which are down 80%. Interesting. And, and there, there have been two or three reasons for that. One is, of course, uh, the work from home culture in the US. Mm -hmm. I mean, except for the East Coast uh, and the bigger, larger cities like New York and Boston and some of the larger cities, where people have come, are coming back to work. Yeah. Uh, in the West Coast and, and, and Middle America, uh, most of the people are still working from home. Mm -hmm. So you have a lot of vacancy uh, in commercial buildings. So that's one. Mm -hmm. uh, all the REITs were borrowing at 1% to 1.5% mm -hmm. since two, three years back. Mm -hmm. And they were levered up uh, 50% at least. Mm -hmm. Now they are paying 6% mm -hmm. uh, uh, interest. So that's mm -hmm. gone about four, 4 to 5 times. And right. they are not and people are giving up commercial property because right. people are not coming back to work. So it's basically just double whammy. Mm. You don't have tenants. Interest mm. rates have gone up. And hence, a lot of the people, in fact, are giving their uh, keys back to the lender and says, mm. why don't you go and sell it? And yeah. property prices are down 50 to 80% in the U.S. In wow. fact, I don't know whether you know a lot of large players like Blackstone also. Mm. Um, have actually uh, 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 defaulted on some of their some of their properties or SPV yeah, specific, to, specific to specific to certain certain SPVs. Yeah. So that that's what happens in REIT. If you come to India, India is hmm. slightly different hmm. because Indian REITs are related to a lot of the developers. So embassy hmm. will have a REIT, K Raja will have a REIT. Where yeah. the liquidity is not as much as the as the US US markets. Right. Um and and in India they allow twenty percent under construction. Right. And and uh, obviously um uh, leverage leverage is, is allowed. Mm. So the 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 REIT market in India is still in a very nascent stage. Yeah. So I would say one should look at actually the US markets because that's probably one of the most mature markets in the in the REIT space. Mm. The Singapore market is also very, very mature. Mm. And Singapore REIT uh, prices are a lot like, uh, behave a lot like the US. Mm. The difference there is that in Asia, again, everyone has come back to pretty much work. Mm. Uh, whereas in the US, people are still working from home. Yeah. I, I hope that answers the question, Yash. Yeah. So that if it's now with SM read something into the picture, I am assuming you're going to apply for that license rather than the reach license, which is a standard minimum requirement of passage. 
Yes, so we are in right. the process. We are talking to our lawyers to apply right. for the SM Reed, SM Reed license. You are absolutely right. right. Uh, for SM Reed, so let's say if you can go 50 crore worth of assets in an SCV and you list it on an exchange, do you need a merchant banker or investment banker to help you get a listing on the exchange? So, yes, that's what the regulation says. Okay. That a merchant banker has to be appointed. Right. And effectively, you need to do it like an IPO. Right. Uh, so even if you list a 75 crore read, you should appoint a merchant banker. Right. You should go through the documents. You should file the documents with SEBI. Right. SEBI then gives approval and then right. you uh, get the money. Right. But obviously, there are practical issues around it, right? right. Firstly, sellers want their money within 60 days. Right. So if SEBI takes more than 60 days, how do you how do right. you start taking the money? That's That's one. Mm. Appointing a merchant banker is absolutely fine, yeah. uh, but typically merchant bankers uh, get money from institutions. Mm. They don't collect from retail. We Correct. have the distribution for retail, Correct. so merchant bankers can then help in the documentation. Mm. So that could be there. But but these nuances still are being discussed with Sebi. Yeah, our founder had met with Sebi and they've been discussing these things. Right. And making sure that you don't have issues around it. Mm. And I'm sure I'm sure the SEBI, SEBI understands these things mm. and, and they'll come up they'll come up with um, uh, some nuances which, which can uh, uh, practically solve these problems. Mm. Now the the point I was coming to add is you will have to pay this merchant bankers, right? And I I assume it's at least two to three percent of your overall asset size. Because they speak the all the time, many money. And when you have to pay that, will take percent. Your margins shed, or either the investor yeah. has to pay for it. Somewhere. So it's, I mean, I, my assumption is that the yields that you're offering in uh, FOB structure right now might go down when you have to uh, do it by the SMG structure because of the added compliance cost and mortgage banking cost and all that sort of And you would agree to that, right? No. No, absolutely. So very, very fair observation. Uh, yeah. Yash, it's, uh, I would just say it's early days. Yeah. yeah. You know, obviously we're going to, we go to, we're going to negotiate with the merchant bankers. Right. We want to make sure that our investors get the best returns yeah. because that's why they're coming to us. Right. Yeah. Uh, our, our cost structure is, uh, lower. Yeah. That's what, that's what we, uh, like, like to do. Yeah. And that's why I think it also becomes imperative over time. You'll see that sizes will increase. Mm -hmm. So 50 crores, instead of doing 50 crores, we might do 150, 200 crores Correct. and bring down overall costs mm -hmm. so that the return to the investor is still mm -hmm. the same or high. Mm -hmm. But like yeah. I said, I think it's going to evolve. Yes. Yeah, uh, yeah, I think it's a question Holy of, you know, I mean, yeah. give it 12 months, 18 months, 24 months, it's going to be different. And as the mutual fund industry evolved over mm -hmm. time, mm -hmm. this will also evolve. I just feel this will be much faster. Mm. Because the fund in, mutual fund industry took a long time. Mm. Uh, this, I think the timing will just compress and you'll see it evolving very quickly. Mm. I think the SEBI chairperson is also very bullish on this segment overall. Smartby is very, very bullish on it. In fact, uh, I've seen her videos also. And mm. she's encouraging people to, to invest in these alternative investments. Mm. So coming to investors, which type or, or what type of investors should invest in these kind of opportunities? Why should they have, let's say, fractional ownership or read in their course? So, you know, uh, let me, uh, yes, let me take a step back, right? Hmm. Let's talk about where do investors put in money, right? Okay. Uh, investors put in money in fixed income products. Right. And when I say fixed income products, it can be fixed deposits in corporates. It can be fixed deposits in banks. Right. It can be corporate bonds across mm -hmm. uh, various uh, credit. So it can be a triple A corporate bank, bond, double A, single A, whatever. Whatever your risk capital. Yeah. Then you have people who put in equities. Mm -hmm. When you talk about equities, you put in cash equities, where you directly invest in shares of some companies, mm -hmm. or you go through the mutual fund route, right? Because you give, you say, okay, the asset manager has the expertise. I'll I'll give it to them. Yeah. Then thirdly, what's also happening is you have the alternative space. Mm. Now, alternative space can be AIFs, mm. can be now SM REITs, mm. can be a structured credit fund, mm. 
or it can be something else, right? Yeah. But anything to do with slightly different nuances as compared to uh, the other products. Then yeah. I always see them, and personally also I can tell you, I also have money in alternates. Right. And when I, talk, when I talk about alternates, like I have invested money in the HBITS platform also, that but is. I also wanted to see how's how's the platform, right? So, right. so you know, effectively personal skin in the game, not firm, but personal skin okay. in the game. So that yeah. I understand it. Yeah. Uh, whether it works properly, whether I'm getting my rental income, everything. So that's that's one. Uh, yeah. uh, so how I would say, look at as an asset allocation. Yeah. If you have 100 rupees, and depending on your age, yeah. you decide where to put it. People who are older, yeah. I think, need passive income. Yeah. And they are more skewed towards fixed income, to some extent, alternative products. If you're younger, you can be more aggressive, and you can be more into uh, equities. Yeah. But on an asset class basis, if I was to say if I had 100 rupees, my where would I put in alternates? I mean, mm. as you know, Yash, I mentioned my real estate portfolio is so large. Right? Yeah. And fortunately for me, I, I made a reasonable amount of wealth around that. Yeah. So I'm now switching personally from residential, for switching from holiday homes into mm. a lot of these alternates, mm. which then give me a good passive income of 8 to 9%. Hmm. And can give me IRRs of fifteen to sixteen percent, yes. and that's what I'm doing. Yeah. Really? So I would say anything between ten and twenty percent, hmm. you could have in alternates. And depending depending on the wealth, right? If you if you're worth ten crores, you can say, okay, I want to put more. If you're hmm. worth one crore, maybe less. If you're worth hundred crores, maybe you can do more. Yeah. It also depends on your overall wealth. But I would say anything between 10 and 20% yeah. do look at alternates. I mean, this corroborates. So basically, I run a WhatsApp community on alternative investments. And uh, we have roughly around 850 participants in it. I recently ran a poll as to how many of you have how much of your portfolio in alternatives. And you won't believe around 37% participants say they have more than 30%. In alternatives, yeah, right now. Uh, but that's not only real estate based alternative, that's also things uh, going on like uh, invoice discounting or ease based financing and uh, you know, SEIs, which are also picking up quite uh, equity in the market. But uh, it's an interesting area. People are genuinely curious, I would say, uh, as to you know, I want to make the best buck out of my mind, but uh, it's also confusing to a lot of people because there's a lot of awareness work. That needs to be done as well. Uh, so spaces are confusing. So that brings me to my next question. So there are, I think, so roughly about ten to fifteen years right now in this actual ownership case. I know you said only three or four will survive the test of time, but uh, within those fifteen to twenty years, uh, why edgeheads or you know rather not only edgeheads but if somebody uh, as a retail investor has to choose which platform to go well, what should they look at? So I would say, uh, and I won't even sell it with, uh, mm. because I know what we are, uh, mm. but I'll just tell you what investors should look at. One, do look at the management team of the organization. I think it's very, very important. That's mm. first. Secondly, firstly, also see how long have they been in existence. Mm. That's, I think, in a way, it's important. Thirdly, the properties which they have been bringing onto the market. Mm. How have they actually done in terms of mark to market? Is that data available? Publicly? I mean, we, uh, data is available publicly. You should be able to get it. Like, for example, each bit, if someone asks us, right. all our properties, where's the valuation? We can okay. provide the valuation. Okay. And these are independent values. And this is what SEBI is also going to say, right? Yeah. Because how is it going to trade in the listed market yes, yeah. unless you have valuation? Right. So that, I think, becomes again. Uh, very, very important. Mm. And, and I think, fourthly, just, just look at the platform, right? I mean, look at some of the credentials which people have. Mm. How's that How's that done? When you want to exit, mm. have you been given exit? And these mm. are some of the things which which you should you should look at. But I think one, two most important things are one is the management mm. and one is look at the mark-to-market and how the 
properties are actually done. It basically mm. means how are these people actually identifying the micro market? Yeah. Are they spending time there? Mm. One of the reasons we are very, very careful and not very aggressive in keeping acquiring is mm. because we want to acquire the right property. Yes, that's mm. very important. Mm. Got it. And how frequently does one need to do this independent valuation of the property? So we just do it yearly. Okay. Uh, I would ideally like to do it six monthly. Okay. Uh, because I don't think property prices change so much. Right. Uh, but but definitely six monthly would be ideal. Done. I would say. Done. And I would at least urge my organization to to start doing that. Okay. And I think so. The SM REITs regulation says uh, it to be done yearly. If I'm not wrong. That's that's correct. That's correct. Yeah. You know, that's, I mean, if you do it six monthly, it's great, right? It's only yeah. really good for the investor. Mm. So I, do, I would like to try and do it. Sorry, my stupid question, but let's say the 10 lakhs requirement in SMD. So will it, you said in the denomination of 10 lakh rupees on the exchange or will it be fractionalized even more? Only the PIP will be done as 10 lakh rupees. So initially, I think, yes, it will be listed as a 10 lakh. Oh, okay. Uh, but over time, as uh, has uh, uh, the chairperson also mentioned, she wants to get it to one lakh, right? Mm. So over time, the denomination will change. Right. I think initially it will be listed as a ten lakh denominated instrument, and it so, will be in DMAT form. Right. So the liquidity might not be that great at a very start, but uh, hopefully in next two, three, four years, it should start picking up. My guess is. Uh, uh, in 18 to 24 months, yes, liquidity right. will pick up a lot. Okay. And can you, let's say when you create a REIT, can you add more assets into it? Uh, like uh, at a platform level, or what do you need to do from an exchange? Yet? Because that REIT is already listed on the exchange, right? So how does it work? Or does the investor need to provide more money? Something like that. So great question, uh, Yash. So it's going to be, the REIT is going to be listed as a trust. Yeah. Mm. And it will have different schemes. Mm. So every scheme will be one unit, right? Mm. So suppose I acquire a 100 crore building. That right. will be scheme one. Mm. That will be listed as scheme one. Then okay. scheme two, then scheme three, then scheme four. And investors can buy or sell different schemes. Okay. So it's going to be listed as different schemes initially. Mm. And then, of course, you could combine it overall as a, see, if it becomes 5,000 crores, you could list it as a REIT. Mm. If you really want to. Mm. But these will be different schemes listed in the SMB. Um, one of the things, uh, yes, I feel people should compare this instrument mm. uh, uh, to other instruments. So, firstly, you should compare it to fixed income, right? Mm. This instrument is a triple A instrument. If, okay. your tenant is, if your tenant is triple A. Okay. Like in our case, we've, we've launched a property in Pune. Its tenants are Air Products, which is a $55 billion company listed on NYSE. And then you have Amdoc, which is traded on NASDAQ, which is a $10 billion company. If you were to rate these tenants in India, then you would get a AAA rating. Well, so effectively, your instrument becomes a AAA instrument mm. because the rental which is being paid by these two so eight to nine percent rental income right. plus benefit of capital appreciation. Yeah. Capital appreciation pretty much I wouldn't say is guaranteed because that's a very wrong word. Yeah. But it's a given that if you will get anything between five and seven percent, because rental escalation is typically five percent per annum. Yeah. So that gets um, basically into the asset prices as yeah. after four or five years. So when you sell, you will sell at the pretty much the same uh, rental which you've got in today, yeah. not <clears throat> assuming that interest rates have remained the same. Right. If interest rates go down, you'll get even more compression. Right. So this is an asset class which you can easily get between 14 and 16%. Mm -hmm. And compares a lot better uh, equities, fixed income, commodities. Mm -hmm. The only uh, disadvantage today mm -hmm. It's not a very liquid instrument, right? If you were Damn. to exit, it might take 30 to 45 days. So that's the liquidity premium. Yeah. That's it. But as an asset class, commercial, Damn. if done well, 
uh-huh. is actually amazing. Right. And can you imagine a triple A asset? You're getting effectively 15, 16 percent. Yeah. Not you know, not any. I mean, invoice discounting when you do these are all triple B names, yeah, double B right. names. Mm-hmm. Then you have secured credit, right? I mean, you can have single B, double B names also. Mm. Which is why I think people should understand as it. Mm-hmm. Which is why I think I think people are starting to understand a lot more, yeah. and people are treating it more as a financial instrument right. rather than as real estate. Okay. And as it becomes more and more liquid, mm. it effectively becomes a financial instrument. Mm. Interesting. Uh, from expense perspective, like given you have and this one are two years as a co-founder or as the CFO, uh, what do you think is the primary challenge or can be a primary hurdle for expense to grow even bigger or let's say meet your targets of 1500s here? Uh, so the only challenge I would say is, so acquisition of property is not a challenge. Right. There are enough of it. We're getting enough of it. Acquisition of investors is very important. Mm. And that we are doing through branding, you know, marketing, mm. salespeople. Uh, we need to increase the velocity of sales, right? Mm. Which is what we are doing. Say if you are doing two crores a day today, I need to do four crores a day. Correct. So that's how you grow. Right. And it's, I wouldn't say it's a challenge. Mm. It's, a, it's a process. Mm. And a process is take. A process because uh, they exactly. need to build trust. Right, trust is exactly. the main thing here, so, and which is what we are really trying to do: build trust. Which is why I personally get involved with investors, talking to them what I believe in. Personally, I put in money to understand the process, and yeah. that I think is very important. And it's, yeah. it's trust. Trust you build over time. Trust yeah. is never built in a day. Oh, absolutely agree. Because you talked about acquiring a property is easier, or uh, uh, at least you have it figured on your side. Uh, might be an appropriate question to ask, yeah. but is there still a concept for black money, commercial properties, and you have to deal with these kind of things when you're doing the due diligence? No, we don't have to deal with it, firstly, because we don't take that at all. Right. So we don't even discuss that. Right. Uh, we have not come across, and I think people have moved away from it completely, okay. especially around the commercial space. Mm. Maybe in, in the resi space, maybe it's there, or holiday homes, maybe it's there. Mm. But commercial space, a lot of it, especially in the larger cities, people have moved away from it. Right. So we don't, we don't have to deal with it at all. Okay. And within the commercial space, are you targeting any particular pockets like warehouses or data centers or uh, something else like offices? So offices we've done, right? right. We've done 365 crores, all offices. We are also targeting warehouses. We are also targeting uh, hospitals. We are targeting data centers also. Mm. Anything yes. non-residential? Which makes sense, yeah, mm. because it's not about entry only, it's mm. actually about exit. Yeah. When are you able to exit and at what IRR? Mm. And every time we uh, give an info memo to an investor, mm. it clearly indicates what the IRR is we expect on exit. Okay. So we look at any asset class other than resi, mm. uh, but uh, depending on where we can exit and at what IRR. Mm. And if it makes sense, we'll do it. Okay, fair enough. And uh, are you focusing primarily on tier one cities right now? You're open to going into tier two, tier three cities as well as in the opportunities right now. We are open to do tier two cities also. Oh. Uh, presently, because the tier one opportunities are a lot, yeah. so we have focused on it. Whether mm. it's Pune, whether it's Bangalore, whether it's Mumbai, uh, but we are very open around tier two cities. And, so a lot uh, of our investors come through, come from tier two cities. Mm. Got it. Yeah, I think uh, the one thing I would say, Yash, is it's a very secure instrument for investors. Mm. Mm. Uh, and and the SPV we create right now, it's a bankruptcy remote vehicle. Yeah. Uh, so it doesn't matter what what happens to HFITs. Right. Uh, we are we are just the asset manager. So so the investor has always got a real asset mm. backing that triple A rental yield. Which he's getting. Perfect. So it's a, uh, so security wise, it's very very good for the investor. Maybe, maybe. And as HBITs, because you're the investment managers of the property, what kind of uh, management fees or other fees that we charge? We charge one percent per annum uh, management okay. fees. 
That's fair. Oh. And then on, then on exit, we charge typically 15% over 10% hurdle. Okay. 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 So it's just like any uh, EIS or something like a wealth manager who is running a PNS side of something. Exactly. Okay. Perfect. And we also want to, you know, make money for the investors so that we can charge our fee. If we don't make that yeah, money, yeah, yeah. what's the point for them? Yeah. No, the interests are aligned and that's what has yes. been in the asset management industry also for a long, long time. Absolutely. Great, Samir. Uh, 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 I will just finish with one last question. Uh, because you talked about uh, 65 to 70 percent of your portfolio is in property, I'm very curious to know what other 35 percent comprises of. Um, so I would say... Uh, 25% of that is in equities. Right. Indian equities or and, global equities? Uh, Indian and global. Global. Okay. Uh, more, more global, I would say. Okay. And and uh, rest 5% is in commodity, in precious metals. Oh, wow. Okay. Okay. So. And nothing on the other alternatives side, right? Like private equity or AIS or something like that. Uh, it's there. Uh, okay. I would say in private equity, but it's a, it's a small proportion. Right. I mean, it's okay. less than it's less than five percent, so that's why I didn't say it. Sorry. Okay. Got it. Do it. Uh, thank you so much, Samir. Uh, learned a lot today. Uh, I mean, I am very ignorant about this area, to be very yeah, honest, but right. uh, because I will understand property real estate very well. Like I said, it needs a lot of domain knowledge to really understand the market. Yeah. And when talking to him. I'm not sure you've got that. So thank you so much for uh, coming to this podcast. Really, really loved having. Thank you. Thank you, Yash. Thank you so much.